It is a pleasure to participate in this event organized to release the book Connecting Through Culture, an overview of India's soft power, edited jointly by Shri Vinay Sahasar Buddhe and Shri Sachidan Joshi, which is the first of its kind anthology of essays on India's soft power. The book discusses in detail different aspects of country's soft power strength. The book, I hope, shall initiate a nationwide or one should hope global discussion on India's soft power. My congratulations to Shri Sahasra Buddha and Shri Sachidanand Joshi for their remarkable work. Soft power is a term of recent coinage. But the concept is not new to India. Rather, it is deeply rooted in Indian cultural and civilizational ideals and ethos. It has been said, and said not recently, few thousand years back, Bharata se pirtishthe due sanskirtam sanskirti tatha. India's prestige or India's power depends on two factors and they are Sanskrit language and Sanskriti, that is the culture of India. Then further it has been asserted that Indian culture is totally dependent on Sanskrit language. Sanskriti, Sanskrita Shrita. So India has attached always, in fact, it has again, it has been asserted by very well-known people that Indian society has never viewed the kings and generals as their ideal or models. The Indian society has always viewed thought leaders who were known as rishis, our sages, and even those who wielded power, they walked to their ashrams in the forest to seek their guidance. This is the foundational virtue of Indian culture and we are talking about connecting through culture. And here I would like to refer to what Guru Dev Rabindranath Tagore, whose name figures among five persons who have been described as our, uh, what term you have used? Iconic figures. He said, I love India not because I cultivate the idolatry of geography, not because I have had the chance to be born in her soil, but because she has saved through tumultuous times the living words which issued from the illuminated consciousness of her children. Satyam Gyanam Anantam Brahma Shantam Shivam Advetam. He, it was he only who has said, and which explains beautifully and powerfully the genius of India. He said, India cannot attain true independence unless it is recognized that her foundation is in mind, which with its diverse powers, 
and confidence in those powers goes on all the time creating Swaraj for itself. Swaraj means an order, political, social, economic order, which is totally committed to the public welfare, particularly to the last man, as described by Mahatma Gandhi. So these, these, and that is why India, uh, you know, if we refer to 10th and 11th century history books written by Arab historians, right from Tabri to Ibn Kasir, Ibn Asir, even Ibn Khaldun, then most of them have devoted few pages in the first chapter to India. And the basis, I will come to the basis late, later, what they have said is that the, the whole world, there are five dominant civilizations or cultures. All other countries are member of this camp or that camp. The Persian civilization is known for its splendor. The Chinese civilization is known for its craftsmanship and obedience to law. Romans for their beauty and chivalry. Turks for their bravery. And finally they say Indian civilization is one which is known for promotion of knowledge and wisdom. And possibly, that is the, that I consider is the foundational virtue of Indian culture and civilization. And possibly, the basis for this assessment is a prophetic saying, Ajidu rihal ilmi min biladil hind. I am feeling the cool breeze of knowledge coming from the land of India. So what distinguishes India is not uh, its military strength or any other aggressive power. India has always been, even today we are talking about India aspiring for the role of Vishwa Guru. What is Vishwa Guru? Vishwa Guru is not a title, is not a position, it is a role. And we feel that this role has been performed by India in the past. And now we are aspiring that we are able to revive that kind of situation. What is Vishwa Guru? The Indian sages, have clearly spelt it out. They say, etad desha parshu tasya sakashad agraj anmana swam sam charitram shikcheran prithviyam sarvam anava. A long time back, our sages had envisaged that India should have the knowledge power which is able to attract people from all over the world not to study Indian culture and civilization. But we should have the kind of teachers who are proficient, who have deep grip on other cultures and people from other countries to know about their own culture, to study about their own civilizational value they travel to India. That can happen only when that kind of teachers are available and that kind of teachers were available in Nalanda. So many, there are so many historical accounts. In Takshila, in the old universities, which during the course of time, because of many other factors, they were uh, destroyed because this was the culture of knowledge and wisdom, promoted knowledge and wisdom. Therefore, peace is needed. There is need to 
eliminate any chances of conflict. Therefore, India made, at the beginning of its civilizational journey, India made a proclamation of universal, eternal truth. Ekam sad vipra bahuda vadanti. The truth is one, but it is perceived as many. India always believed that all people should not be confined to one single interpretation of reality. And therefore, we accepted diversity to us since ancient times. Diversity implied acceptance and coexistence, not tolerance. Acceptance and respect for a tradition to which we do not belong. Acceptance and tolerance. And Swami Vivekananda goes to the extent of saying that when somebody, he said, we do not tolerate, you tolerate the antics of a child. We accept and respect every tradition. And he says when somebody talks of tolerance, it sounds like blasphemy to me. I have no right to, to tolerate anybody. Whatever path one chooses, I am duty bound to accept it and respect it. So when diversity has been attached so much significance and importance in Indian tradition, the human society also needs unity. Uh, we have uh, praised, in fact, we have recognized that diversity is not something which uh, basically it came, the discovery by our sages as the law of nature. Human beings are bound to differ. They are bound to have different uh, thinking, different mindset, different attitude, and that must be respected. So, but unity is also the need of the human society to how to create unity, sense of unity and fraternity in the society. Then the Indian sages, what they did was that uh, they did not use either race or language or even religious faith as the basis for unity. Because if you accept race or language or religious faith, then many people are excluded. Therefore, they decided or they made Atma the soul of man as the single basis for creating unity. Ahem Brahmasmi, the God in the form of the soul dwells in me. Same God in the form of soul dwells in you. That must create a sense of unity among us. And this interconnectedness through soul, Atma, should give rise to the feeling of fraternity. That was, the, that was the basis which Indian sages used to create. In fact, that is why it came to be described as a universal vision. Because we, Indian culture does not view a person in terms of the variable and alienable characteristics, like which are associated with the birth, color of the skin, what language you speak, how you uh, worship your God, you believe or you do not believe. Rather, Indian culture views a person in terms of invariable and inalienable characteristic that is the Atma which dwells, the innate divinity of the man, the divine potential of the man, about which Swami Vivekananda said that he said, my mission can be explained in very simple words. I want to teach unto mankind, not to Indians, not to people belonging to any particular faith tradition. No, I want to teach unto mankind their divinity and its manifestation in all movements of life. And in fact, again, uh, something comes to my mind that Gurudev Rabindranath Tagore, when 
he was awarded Nobel Prize in his acceptance speech, he referred to the Upanishadic idea of oneness of being, Vahdatul Vujut, where he, uh, he, he referred to these two Upanishad lines from the Upanishad, Yastu Sarvani Bhutani Atmani Vanu Pashyati Sarva Bhuteshu Chatmanam Tato Naviju Gupta Se. One who perceives his own self in all beings and all beings in his own self, he is left with no room, no scope for nursing aversion or separateness from anybody. The pain of the other becomes his own pain. The problems of the other become his own problems. That is the cultural heritage of India. That is what India stands for. And that is why Indian thought, in the Indian thought emphasizes that the human body must be considered as the temple of God. Deho Devalaya Prokto Devo Prokto Jiva Deva Sadashiva. The human body must be respected. Anybody, everybody, we must cultivate the sense of respect for everybody and anybody. But it does not, we can't, in the light of these uh, teachings or this cultural heritage, we cannot ignore the other aspect also. That uh, we are living in a world and India has gone through that, where mere soft power is not enough. So what the Indian culture says about that? Here the Indian culture says, Agarta chaturo veda prashta sacharam dhanu idam brahmam idam chhatra. Shastra dapi, shastra dapi. When you are subjected to an aggression, when you, are, you face those who have evil designs, then you should not only have the fully equipped with knowledge and wisdom, the soft power, but on the, on the back, on your back, you should be armed with weapons. These weapons, Indian culture says that we, these weapons are not meant to dominate over others, to impose your views on others. But these weapons are meant to defend yourself against the aggressor. I have no hesitation to say that in the period of decline, India ignored this aspect. And that is why we were subjected to many humiliations. And now, definitely, the after independence, more so now, the leadership is fully aware, but our thrust, India will remain India as long as our thrust will be on the soft power and to be more specific, to promote the tradition of knowledge and wisdom. And our freedom movement itself is a great example possibly the only movement in the freedom movement in the world, where only soft power was employed to throw out the colonial power. Satya Ahisa and Satyagira. And India became an example. And I would say if you look around the world, we generally, we generally ignore some developments in USA, in South Africa, Nelson Mandela, in USA, Martin Luther King, they all got their inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi. Well, you can think about it. Would it have, without the movement launched by Martin Luther King, would it have been possible for Mr. Obama 
to become the president of USA. And that movement was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. First time when I went to Indonesia, outside the palace, Indonesia, everybody knows, is a Muslim country, overwhelmingly Muslim country. Outside the palace, there is a huge statue of Krishna Arjun Samvat outside the presidential palace, like our India, India Gate, lawns. So our ambassador in Indonesia told me, he said, ask any Indonesian, what is this? He will say Krishna Arjun Samvat. Then tell them, but you are a Muslim country and this is a Hindu icon. And you will see that if you, if you ask this question to 10 people or 100 people, they give an answer which is almost identical. On the suggestion of our ambassador, I asked this question. We were strolling there and I asked this question. And everybody said, yes, of course, Islam is our religion and this is our culture. Culture has nothing to do with your faith. Culture has geographical connect. And to give you a more interesting example, I think I have already taken more time than allotted. So I will conclude with this, that uh, uh, on a f this is a lighter note. Go to the YouTube and you will find this clip there where they are somebody is making this point that they went to attend some wedding reception in Pakistan in Lahore. The guests were there, but the bride and bridegroom were absent for a long time. Then everybody started becoming restless. Why bride and bridegroom are not coming? Is there any problem? No, no, no problem. Finally, the father explained to the guests, you know, these Indian films have created so much problem that the bride and bridegroom are in the backyard. They are taking phera around the Agni. This was on the day of marriage reception. So culture, even if you, even if you deny it, but as that famous Western author has said in his book, outliers, who you are, cannot be separated where you come from. Thank you very much. Jai Hind.